Hi, and welcome to Dollars and Making Sense, a weekly show about finance, money, investing. I am your host, Ray Treveson from OTG Capital. We broadcast every week uh, locally on Radio Northern Beaches and nationally around Australia on the Community Radio Network. I'm really pleased to welcome back to the microphone Liz Moran from Fixed Income News Australia. Now, for those of you that are new to the show nationally, you wouldn't have heard from Liz before, but Liz used to come on the show regularly before we were just on uh, Radio Northern Beaches. So, Liz, welcome back. Thanks so much for having me, Ray. Wonderful, wonderful. Now, I really like Fixed Income News Australia. Why? Because I have a fixed income product, so I'm very biased, all right? So I love bonds, and when people talk to me and uh, ask me a lot about equities and stuff, I look at them and I go all scrunched up in my face and go, I'm not so big into equities because I like bonds because I understand them better. I like them because they're simpler, and I like them because they're not volatile, and I'm, I'm getting on in my years, and volatility is something that I don't particularly like. And so it's really uh, great to have you back on the show because I've had a lot of people on the show recently where we've been talking about a whole range of different products and offerings, uh, talking a little bit about super as well. And one of the things that I'm still concerned about, uh, Liz, and maybe before we get into today's topic, um, uh, do you still see that people aren't getting into bonds as much as we think that they should be? Oh, it's really interesting you say that, Ray. Um, I was just reading about some stats of the inflows into ETFs in Australia. Mm -hmm. And um, amazingly, bonds are the largest growth segment. And from January, yes, hooray, <laughs> uh, January <laughs> to August, um, there's something like $4.4 billion flowing into fixed income ETFs in Australia. Wow. That's good to hear. That's good to hear because I, I keep saying to people that if you're not sure about what you're doing in the stock market and you, you're sedate and want reasonable returns, and we can talk, we're, we're going to talk a little bit more about this in the show, but I think bonds is a really good median for people to get into. It's not fixed term deposits where you, you're giving your money to, to a high street bank and, and getting not a, even now with higher interest rates. It's still not great. You know, when you consider how much everything is costing. So, look, today um, I've asked you on the show because I, I wanted to talk about US government bonds. Mm -hmm. And so US government bonds are one of those kind of things. It gets mentioned in the news quite a lot. And, and so when bond yields are going up or bond yields are going down, these are seen as fairly major market indicators. Okay, so so Liz, we, we've covered bonds in that very first show, but we've got a, a bigger, newer audience now. So let's go back to some basics and cover off what is a bond specifically, and then let's talk about government bonds as well. A bond rate is just a loan from the investor to the entity issuing it. Now that might be a government, or it might be a company, or mm -hmm. it might be even a private company, um, or it could be um, what they call uh, supranational, supranational, which is a government-like body, like um, the World Bank, as an example. So okay. there's a whole range of issuers of bonds, which allows investors to really choose their risk and return. It's a really massive um, asset class and really well worth getting to know, even if you don't want to ever invest. So a bond is just a loan. You sort of take the place of the bank, if you like, and you lend the money. And the contract is that the the um, company or the government must pay you principal um, when they say they're going to and they must pay you interest when they say they're going to. And a lot of bonds are either fixed or floating rate and fixed rate bonds pay six monthly interest and floating rate bonds pay quarterly interest. There are also inflation linked bonds, but I won't go into those today. They're oh. a bit more complex. Um, so you can uh, build a bond portfolio that pays you um, in effect, monthly interest because the interest payment date um, is dictated by when the bond is issued. And that can be, bonds can be issued any business day of the year. So unlike the share market where you just get paid twice a year, a bond portfolio can generate like a monthly income. And so I think it's a really salient lesson for listeners to the show that, you know, when you are buying a bond, you are lending money. And when you think about lending money, I always like to bring it back to first principles and say, imagine you were lending money to somebody in your family, probably not a good example, I guess. But, you know, when you lend money to somebody, you have 
have an expectation of getting that money back at some time in the future. And if you've made an agreement, you get interest as well. And so part of that agreement is how often you get that interest and how much that interest will be. And a bond is no different, I guess, in that regard. So you talk about um, interest rates and you talk about payment schedules. Uh, sometimes they're referred to as coupon rates. So again, there's a lot of jargon. And I think FINA is a really good place for people to go to. And I think I'll do a, a, a shameless plug very quickly for FINA. What's your website address for people to look at? Thinkcomenewsaustralia.com.au. You can find us. Wonderful. Okay. And again, a, a good internet search engine will find you as well. So look, today we're talking about US government bonds and they've been very uh, topical. Uh, can you tell me why? Well, uh, interestingly, the um, American economy has been stronger than everyone's expected. So rates are the Fed who sets the Fed, Fed funds rate target. And at the moment, it's 5.25 to 5.5%. So they've set that monthly like in Australia, we um, look at the cash rate, but there's been pressure on upwards pressure on that because the data coming back from the market is so strong. So employment's very strong in the market, as is man the manufacturing index. Uh, a number of different data points that um, global investors and the Fed look at have been stronger than expected. So there hasn't been necessarily the indicators to indicate the uh, Fed will start reversing rates um, and start coming off off rates. Inflation has come off, but then there are all these other global um, factors impacting the market at the moment. And as you would be aware with the um, recent Middle East conflict in Israel, oil prices are starting to look like they might go higher because of blockages or, of supply or lower supply, um, also lower supply coming out of Ukraine. So oil um, and, and fuel prices are a really important component of inflation because if you think of goods getting to market, they have to be shipped. So they have to come from overseas or even locally, even locally your fruit and vegetables. Um, in Australia, you know, you know, you might have pineapples grown in Queensland. Well, it's going to cost more to get them to uh, the Victorian market. So mm -hmm. oil prices really impact inflation and higher oil prices at the moment look like inflation is going to be sustained for longer. So I think it's really important for a younger audience to get some context here because you and I are both old enough, and I hate to say this, but you know, you and I have lived through much higher interest rates in our time. But the past 10 years, other than the last 18 months, has been symptomatic of very, very low interest rates. And so you know, if we cast our minds back 18 months or so, interest rates were rock, rock bottom and at levels that you and I had never seen. And the forecasts were, even from the central banks, that these were going to stay very, very low for a long, long time. They got that one wrong, that's for sure. And so we cast now to present day. And even you know, depending on when you're listening to this show, it's still, you know, we're talking about uh, raised interest rates that have really escalated from the past 12 to 15 months. And it's a, an environment that many people are not familiar with. And so with that in mind, you know, in the past, uh, governments have used bonds to raise money and very famously war bonds, you know, during World War II, the big, you know, circuses that used to go around saying invest, you know, and, and you know, help defend your country. But the government right now, both local and US, are, I guess, promoting bonds because the returns are, are quite solid, aren't they? Well, it's surprising, but um, in the US, for example, terms out from uh, one month to two years are over 5%. So you can get a, five, a US dollar government bond, very, very low risk, and very low risk even coming with that short term to maturity, paying over 5%. And mm. now that that um, is a benchmark for all other securities glo globally, the US dollar government uh, bond rate. So if you're not getting um, that 5% plus a decent margin on top, um, you're probably being underpaid, if you like, for, for your investment. Mm. So you really have to think carefully about how do I invest my money and what's good relative value at the moment. So as an example, the share market um, average dividend yields around about 4% at the moment. So if you can get a 5% on a US uh, government bond, um, which is very low risk, you're not taking any capital risk because your capital will be returned to maturity. I should make a comment though that if you invest direct, you are taking on currency risk. But uh, you actually, good point. yes, yes. 
you actually might want to take on currency risk at the moment because if interest rates move higher in, in the US, funds will flow into the US because people want the higher rates, they're more attractive. And that may well, if, if Australian interest rates don't follow suit, um, mean that our, our Australian dollar falls relative to the US dollar. So it might actually be something investors want at the moment is some US dollar currency risk. But there are a number of different ETFs available um, through uh, on Australian, on the ASX, that you can get um, to invest in US uh, government bonds. Some of them will be hedged and some of them will be unhedged. So that's one thing that's really important to look at. Okay, so I want to just put a marker there on hedged and unhedged because we're just about time for a break here. You're on Dollars and Making Sense, a weekly show about finance, money and investing. I'm Ray Treveson. I'm here with Liz Moran from Fixed Income News Australia. We're going to go for a short break and I want to come back and talk a little bit about that specifically. We'll be back in just a moment. Hi, and thank you for listening to Dollars and Making Sense, a weekly radio program about finance, money and investing on Radio Northern Beaches and nationally on the community radio network around Australia. The views, comments and opinions aired during our program should not be construed or viewed as financial advice. Any commentary is general advice only and does not take into account your objectives, financial situation or needs. You should consider whether the advice is suitable for you and your personal circumstances. If in doubt, you should contact an authorised, licensed financial planner. We welcome questions and feedback and you can get in touch with us via our blog, social media channels or email. Please search for Dollars and Making Sense in your favourite podcast platform or check out our blog at otgcapital.com.au forward slash blog. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Dollars and Making Sense, a weekly show about finance, money and investing. I'm your host, Ray Treveson, and with me this week, I have Liz Moran from the Fixed Income News Australia, and we are talking all things bonds, and specifically today, today we are talking about US government bonds. Now, before we get back into our bonds discussion, before we went to the break, Liz, you were mentioning something about hedged and unhedged ETFs. So if people wanted to invest in US government bonds but didn't want to necessarily do it in the US, we have exchange traded funds here locally in the market that enable you to invest in US government bonds, but you use the term hedged and unhedged. So I just want to uh, decipher that jargon just in case there are audience there that don't understand what that means. Uh, of course. So hedged means the interest rate... Um sorry, the currency rate differential, if it, there's any currency movements, they're not taken into consideration in your return. Ah. Um, so um, hedged means no currency exposure and unhedged means currency exposure. So you actively want to take a, a position in, in the currency as well as um, seeking income from the bonds. Now, usually if you are de-risking something, that means the, the return will potentially be less. So if you're hedging something, that means you're taking out a bit of insurance. So potentially, if I just extrapolate that, that means that your yield may not, you won't make as much money on that one. Whereas unhedged means that you're taking risk, means the return is potentially greater, but also the risk of loss is potentially greater as well, isn't it? Exactly. I'd say the hedged version is like a smoother trajectory if you like you know you mm -hmm. don't you expect the ups and downs that you might get but if you're an active investor and you're always looking at your investments and you take a definite view on the market and I think that's really important in fixed income to have a oh. view on interest rates and inflation because that will dictate whether you prefer fixed or floating rate bonds but um, yes yes so if you're an active investor I would definitely be looking at the unhedged but if you just want to set and forget you're happy to take around about a four and a half to five percent return I think you would then look at the hedged version it's certainly quite a solid return given how safe and how reliable the, this particular type of, of bond is but one of the things we were talking about uh, during the break uh, listeners was that Liz you're going to explain to me now why US bonds are as attractive as they are in comparison to other other potential government bonds that are out there that people could invest in well, as well as the US economy being very strong, there's a number of other factors in play. One of them is um, some of the big investors in US treasuries, such as China and Saudi Arabia, 
are taking are actually selling down their holdings they're not they're not actively buying as much as they, they have in the past so then you take out some of the demand and the US um, their deficit is just growing exponentially all the time and with the new um, Middle East conflict and of course you know they're promising to aid Israel in the conflict it's going to cost more so the deficit's going to grow so you're going to see even a higher a rate of uh, deficit than what has been in the past. So the US government is going to have to issue more and more bonds. So ultimately, if you've got more supply than demand, you have to raise the price. And that's factoring in, that's feeding into the US Treasury um, uh, rate at the moment. I think one of the things that people often lose context of in this market, and given we are tiny, we are 26 million, 27 or so million people, uh, we are a, a fraction of a percentage, I guess, of the world market. When we look at our debt and people start having palpitations, it's like, guys, the US debt would make you bleed many, many times over the amount of debt that those guys are carrying. And it was raised exponentially when they gave themselves tax cuts during the Trump year that I just looked at and go, how can they afford these? But they just decided to do it anyway. And as you've rightly pointed out you know they're supporting their allies and this comes at a cost and i, I guess i am curious as well liz are there's a, a short answer to why the saudis and the chinese are pulling out of the u.s market specifically or is it just they're moving allocation or is it a, a very specific reason no that's an excellent question so a couple of, of reasons for that um i don't know if you remember but back when the ukraine russia conflict started um, the US actually sanctioned Russian investments and wouldn't repay pay them back. And um, that included US government bonds. So all of a sudden, global investors in bonds and um, <clears throat> some of those countries that perhaps don't have good relationships with the US or might be doing things that are actively against US interests uh, retreated from the market. They're nervous mm -hmm. now that they may not be able to get their money out. So, you know, imagine if China, for whatever reason, does decide to um, want to have Taiwan and they go into a conflict there, there's got to be some concern, I think, that they may not be able to get their funds back. So there's a bit of a geopolitical reason uh, for that. Um, I think, too, the US has for a long time and will continue to be for a very long time a global, the global currency because of its stability and size and other reasons. But some of those countries just don't want to be as dependent on the US. Um, so they're also looking to take a step back. So there's multiple uh, factors at, at play there, but there's a couple. Oh, they're, they're fairly solid. And I guess it's one of the things, just like anybody's economy and anybody's budget, even right down to you and I, I think they, what you've just rightly said is that they're looking to di diversify and potentially de-risk. And so if they've got too much you know, in US Treasury bonds, maybe diluting that and maybe spreading it out other places to the euro market, for example. Uh, and, and again, we've seen China uh, do a lot uh, in the Africa region where they're buying very large slabs of the food bowl there for, I think, you know, 30, 50 year type of timeframes. They're, they're not short term investors, those guys, that's for sure. It, it's really fascinating. So US government bonds are hot at the moment. And they're certainly, uh, you know, when you think about the yield, uh, they're, they're, they're pretty attractive. And you've rightly pointed out, you don't have to necessarily have an international uh, trading account. There's an ability to buy locally um, here on a local bond market or uh, an exchange traded fund, an ETF. Now, I'm curious, I get asked this a lot and I'm going to ask you because you're the expert in bonds. Um, I know a lot, but you know a lot more. Um, I get asked this a lot. What is a yield inversion curve when it comes to bonds? What does that mean? Okay, so if you think um, generally, the longer the term you invest for, the greater the uncertainty is going to be. So, you know, just if you're investing in a local market, if you're investing in um, a local company, you know, short term, that company, you know, has um, projections and you can have a certain amount of confidence in it. But the lo longer that you go, the further out you go, the more uncertainty there is. So as an investor, you want to be paid more. So you expect shorter rates of return in the shorter term and longer in the longer term. So mm -hmm. an inverted yield curve is exactly the opposite, where you're getting higher rates now, the short term, 
And over the longer term, you're getting a lower rate of return. And that's actually the US government bond yield curve is an inverted curve at the moment. So you get paid ah. very well short term and less over the longer term. Uh, and that's because there's been a forecast soft landing recession. We're not sure what's going to happen there. Um, but with higher rates, um, there's the government, the central banks are trying to um, reduce spending and bring down inflation. So with an inverted curve, you get paid more now than what you do in the future. And that's for a whole lot of reasons, particularly pertains to government bonds, um, government bonds where the country or the market or the investors are expecting a recession or, or a downturn where rates start to come off. So the Fed would start to cut rates um, over the longer term. So you get paid more now to invest in the shorter term, which can be really appealing. I'm curious then, when you're talking about Treasury bonds, and I know that in my reading, you can buy a 10-year, 20-year, 30-year US Treasury bond. And so with these shorter term bonds now giving a better yield, what kind of impact does that have on the price of those 10, 20 and 30 year bonds? It actually really depends when they were issued. <laughs> because ah. if they were issued a few years ago when interest rates were next to nothing, those bonds now are fairly deeply discounted. So um, bonds are issued with $100 face value and then they're traded. And so they re rarely have that $100 face value in the secondary market. But if they were issued, those bonds were issued three or four years ago at, you know, half a percent or quarter of a percent, and uh, they still have 15 years to run, say now, they're going to be quite deeply discounted. You might be able to buy those bonds for $75, $80. Um, and that the reason the bond price comes off is to make the overall yield um, in line with the market exactly so it sort of, it sort, of the market. sort of balances out for those that were on radio i was just using my hands because we do this in youtube as well but uh, it's fascinating i guess and, and i guess in the context of us government bonds is the same thing happening with australian government bonds or are they a totally different story because of local factors they are actually a different story the um, 10-year rates often mimic or are very close to um, US dollar um, treasuries as well, but mm -hmm. they're lower at the moment and um, we don't have that inverted curve. We have a fairly flat curve. Um, it, there's some movement, um, but it's not inverted at this point. Yeah, it's quite rare to see US interest rates at, at the, the, the levels they are, given that we are traditionally much higher uh, the, the the interest rate differential between you know what we pay on a home loan, for example, compared to what Americans pay, uh, and again traditionally, you know, when I uh, I had a friend that lived in Japan for many years, and you know he was concerned that his home loan rate was going from one and a half percent to one and three quarters percent, and I'm just sitting there going, wow, <laughs> it's just you know every market is different, and I, I guess one of the things I'd like to wrap up today's discussion, Liz, is that. For mine, I get asked this a lot. And so given that you cover the breadth of fixed income right across the broad spectrum, are bonds safe or can they be risky? Bonds can be very risky um, and it very much depends on um, where they're, and this is quite complex to, to get across in a in a face-to-face -face, uh, or radio sense, but Bonds within the same company have different risks. So you can invest in a Westpac bond and there's different three, four different types of bonds, different levels of risk. So you really need to understand um, where the bond sits in the capital structure. Its capital structure is so important and there's a lot on the Fixed Income News website on capital structure. There's education, there's webinars and things. So really important to understand that. I would say government bonds are capital safe, right? So the, your capital is going to be returned at maturity because governments print money. They can assure you you're going to get your capital back at maturity. But if you buy a very long dated bond at a low interest rate, which <clears throat> some big institutional investors are sitting on those bonds, uh, the US dollar bonds, they would have bought a few years ago at very low rates. They'll be sitting on paper losses. Um, 
So if you have to sell before maturity, you can lose money on any bond. Um, but if you hold to maturity and the company or the government survive, you will get your capital back at maturity and you will get your principal along the way. Wonderful. Liz, we're just about out of, about out of time. I will just do another quick shameless plug for the FINA uh, Income uh, News Australia website. There's a ton of really good free resource and our listeners, we love free. So, you know, go and have a look at Liz's website, FINA. Uh, .com.au. There's a really, really good bevy of great webinars, uh, videos, and introduction type stuff, and far more complex stuff as well. Liz, love to have you back. Always love talking about bonds because I'm, I'm one of your biggest fans because I love the product. <laughs> so, I guess from that perspective, Liz Moran from FINA, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so kindly for being on Dollars and Making Sense. Thank you so much, Ray. I really enjoyed it. I just want to give one last plug. On FINA, we actually have a list of ETFs, fixed income ETFs and managed funds. So if you're thinking about investing, it's a good place to start and get a feel for what's out there. Great. Wonderful. And until next time, it's adios.